Hey, Mr. Here we go, going live. Tell me what to do to make all my Lucker Lake dreams come true. Hello, everybody. Bob Lust, the Pond Boss. Must be Wednesday. I woke up this morning and uh, the girls, it was kind of funny. I woke up, I knew where I was, I just didn't know what day it was. And as we were going through the day, the girl said, well, what's your topic going to be? And I said, what's, what, what's going on? And there's Jason Nipstad and Kevin Briggs, first up to bat. Hi, guys. So the girl said, what are you going to talk about today? I said, heck, I don't know. Beats me. I need to think about it a little bit. John Funk, Troy Todd. And I guess it was kind of, uh, I knew where I was. I just didn't know what day it was. So uh, they're kind of making fun of me, so I kind of deserved it. But that's fine. So i uh, got a pretty fun show, I think, lined up. Sometimes I don't, don't know what I'm going to talk about. Sometimes I do. Today I didn't, but now I do. Eric Avery, good to see you, buddy. So uh, what I thought I'd talk about tonight is how to take all the different pieces and how they come together. There's Jim Liner, Todd Austin, Frank James. Good to see you, Frank and Jim. Uh, and how all those things come together to grow really huge fish. So I thought I'd talk about that, but before I get too deep into that, I want to uh, do a couple of things here. Uh, I got a letter. I want to read that letter to you here in a minute. It's pretty dead gum cool. It's, uh, and yes, I found my glasses as soon as I got home. Hell, Debbie, Debbie walked straight to them when I got home. She couldn't believe I couldn't find my glasses. And after I saw where they were, I couldn't believe it either. But uh, anyway, I got a letter and got a real interesting question posted a couple of days ago, and I thought I would attack that one because I'll be able to tie these two things back into the, to the subject matter at hand. So, you know what the drill is? Hashtag Pond Boss Magazine. Click like. And share this to your timeline so you can build an audience. If you do those three things, you're going to be eligible for a drawing for a Pond Boss hat. Look at that. Uh huh? Good quality hat. And a Pond Boss mug that knows how to keep hot things hot, cold things cold. Jaden Roberts, Jeremy Duckworth. Jeremy Duckworth, how you doing, man? Good to see you, buddy. So now I have found the video where I can watch it and read everybody's questions. Oh, yep, they're lining up. Good deal. Let's see. I'm going to make sure I've greeted everybody. I think I have. If I missed you, sorry. I see Leanne's on there now. Good. Todd Austin, I think I said hello. Yep. Oh, good. Good to see everybody. So I think first I'll take you through the question. The question I got that was pretty interesting. It was it came from the Midwest. It came from uh, the Nebraska Iowa area in ag farmland, and it seemed like there's a six acre lake over there that's pretty well managed. They aerate it. Deepest water is about twelve feet. They've got it stocked with a bunch of different species of fish: largemouth bass, um, bluegills. Uh, there's some crappie in it. There's walleye. Let's see, there's um, yellow perch, and I think another couple species of sunfish that are in there. So the deal is, there's Daniel Hendrick, Edward Dosty from Connecticut. Good to see you, man. You're a long way from home watching this here in Texas. I know you guys have been scalding hot the last few weeks. I hope it's mitigated for you. We finally had our first 100 degree day yesterday, so that's pretty standard fare in Texas, but it sure is not from up in New England where you're hanging out. So anyway, um, the, the, the message I got, the question was, a, uh, the co-op sent out a um, crop duster to spray some cropland, probably corn, I didn't ask that question, that just immediately butts up, just to butts this lake on a neighbor's property. And the next day they had fish coming to the surface, major fish kill. So the question was, what do we restock it with? Here's Kyle McKean. Hi, Kyle. And the answer is you don't want to stock it with anything until you assess and see what the damage is. Now, I have been asked on a, on a rare occasion, probably in my 40 years of doing this, probably five times, to either prove up the value of lost fish because of a crop dusting incident or to prove it was the crop dusting incident that caused the fish kill. You know, so what I told him was job one is take a lot of pictures. So if you have anything like this happen to you, take a whole lot of uh, pictures because you have to quantify and prove up that you had deaths, especially if they contested. You know, not only that, you want to write down, get a log, keep write down, count as many fish as you can, 
and, and, and log them according to the size. Don't just put down 124 bass died, put 124 bass, but put, you know, seven 10 to 12 pound bass, you know, five bass in the three to five pound class, etc. because it'll make it easier to value them later. You know, so you got several things on your mind. Edward says he just got done raining there. It's cooler now. That's good. I see Robin checking in, our bookkeeper. So what I told him was, first of all, you need to prove up the harm, what it is, quantify it. That way later you can add value to it as you're talking to somebody about what the actual cause was. So in this case, the co-op owned it. They admitted that they used the wrong herbicide or used a herbicide. It wasn't the wrong herbicide, the wrong pesticide. It wasn't the wrong pesticide. It was the pesticide that they used with wind drift that carried it into the pond and caused the fish kills. So it sounds like they're going to be amenable to, to solving the dilemma. But the question was asked is what fish do you stock? Well, I don't know because you don't know what fish died unless you quantify that. And then my advice was after things settle down, I would do some immediate water chemistry to check for that herbicide or pesticide or whatever it is and verify that it exists, which you have to do that really, really fast because some of those pesticides break down quickly in water. So you need to prove it and then you evaluate. So in this case, I'm recommended that uh, later on when the water cools off to have an electrofishing survey done and just see what the, uh, what the existing remaining fishery looks like and then compare that to what it was if you have a reference point which in this case they've got catch records and then come up with a game plan as to the value or the harm done and then decide what to come back in and restock because if you just go in there and just buy a bunch of fish to replace fish that are gone you don't know if that's the right thing to do or not because in in all fairness if it was a bass crowded lake and it killed about 20% of the bass, you helped the fishery. But now in this case, it was a pretty big fish kill. They had several thousand fish killed. So that's that's pretty serious damage. Now that's all that's what they can see. The electrofishing survey comes in to back up what you see with what you can't see. So you can see the remaining fish if there are any, and if there's not, then that's gonna change the whole picture as to what kind of damages to seek as well as what to do when it comes time to restock the lake. So, there we go. Let's see here. Uh, Jacob West got the whole family watching tonight. Hope you brought some popcorn in a book. <laughs> Dave Weber, did the lake owner say what chemical was used by the crop duster? He did not. And I didn't ask. And all this was in writing. And, you know, I was typing fast as I could. I'm trying to wrap up the September, October issue of Palm Boss. And by the way, there's a little spoiler alert because his question and my answer will be in the next issue of the magazine. I didn't ask the herbicide and I doubt, or the pesticide, and I doubt that he can tell me. Plus, he didn't want his name mentioned because he's, since there's potential litigation involved, he doesn't want his name out there and he doesn't want us talking about that specific case. And I don't blame him. So there's, uh, let's see, Mike Cottrell, Timothy Phillips, Frank James. Hey, Bob, do you have any particular recommendations for how to encourage good hybrid striped bass growth in a pond? You bet. There's uh, Austin Bennett, Dave Gruenwald. Clark Cole, hey guys, good to see you guys. So the way to encourage good hybrid striped bass growth, first of all, is feed them. And secondly, have uh, th this time of year, they don't like hot water. So when we've got temperatures where in the upper reaches of your pond could be 90 degrees, where you drop down four feet and it's 86, and you drop down four feet and it's 83, when you catch them in that 83 degree depth and drag them up to 90, they're gonna fight to the death. So a hybrid striped bass, it's not good to try to catch those this time of year unless, unless you put together a little intensive care unit. Now, I tell you what I like to do with hybrid stripers, when we're electrofishing and we shock up hybrid stripers in the case that we do it in the summer, which isn't common, we've got a live well pumping water out of the lake so we can put them in that live well and shove a whole bunch of fresh lake water over their gills as fast as possible. If you can't do that with a live well, then what you can do is you can bring in one of those huge 84 quart coolers, where those big coolers are, and inject oxygen into the water. You can pump lake water in there and use a little portable oxygen bottle with a uh, diffuser, um, a micro pore filter of some, uh, diffuser of some sort, and you can put pure oxygen in there and bring them back. But that's an aside. That's 
Just don't catch them in the heat if you can't revive them. The uh, way to make them grow faster is to be sure that you got thread fin shad and that you're feeding them really, really well and feed them a good high protein. Speaking of that, one of our sponsors, Purina Mills, they're, uh, they're um, different sport fish, Aquamax sport fish products are really, really good for hybrid stripers. Actually, they're designed for the hybrid stripe bass metabolism and digestive tract. So that's a good choice there. Um, hello, Sheridan Ashmore. Good to see you too. Good evening. You know, and the other thing is um, monitor their growth rates. You know, one of the things that I believe that limits hybrid stripe bass growth is how much food they get. So if you'll weigh and measure some as you go and compare your lengths and weights as you go, then you're going to tell if they're underfed or overfed or not. There's Kelly Duffy. Hey, Kelly, I was just telling them about a, uh, uh, a a message I got a few days ago from up around the Nebraska, Iowa state line up there. Six acre lake where a crop duster flew over the next day. Was, I guess they're spraying corn up there. And then the next day they had a whole bunch of fish dying. So I was trying to take them through the, the exercise of, you know, due diligence. The question was, what do we restock with? The answer is nothing. The answer is prove up your losses, communicate with the people that caused the issue, see if they're amenable. If they're not, find an attorney. Then they'll become amenable. Then you got to prove it. You know, and there's some sampling you can do based on what you know. If you know what kind of pesticides are being used, you can verify that. But after all that settles down and you've got your litigation, your uh, settlement, whatever you're going to do with the, with the causative factor, then the next thing is to evaluate that fishery, then decide what you want to restock. So there, there's your catch up just for you there, Kelly Duffy. Then also got a pretty cool letter. Uh, this is this is fun. I got a letter. This is and, I, and this is an old school. You know, usually I get email letters. So here's one, real one, right here. It says, uh, dear Bob, long time subscriber here, extending greetings from north of the Red River. Hope your buddies in Austin have studied up on how to play football. If not, we'll happily give them another lesson this fall. Go OU. <laughs> Michael Gray's article on the Leaky Pond Club reminded me that I've been meaning to write you. Last issue of the magazine, um, Michael Gray, who's an earth mover, extraordinary pond builder from the Nashville, Tennessee area, central Tennessee, uh, had been engaged to come repair a pond that was leaking. And the fact that the reason that the pond was leaking was of tree roots. Some tree roots had kind of grown there. Dirt had eroded from them, and it was a conduit for water to leave the lake. And he wrote a really good story about that. On our ranch, about 60 miles east of Tulsa, we had an old pond about 80 yards across, a circular in dimension, about 40 yards from our house. Didn't hold water worth spit. I think it was probably built back in the 40s when Bill Skelly's brother of Skelly Petroleum owned the place and used it as a goat farm. <laughs> It would, fill, it would about half fill after heavy rains, but it would leak out and become a weed-filled eyesore within a week or two. After about 10 years of looking at it, I don't know what the hurry was to fix it, I decided we were going to rehabilitate it. We've got a D7, a D3, as well as a skid steer and tractor, so we had the equipment to do it. Began cleaning out all the silt out with the D7, as well as expanding the pond. At about 10 foot of depth, we hit solid sandstone layers. Decent clay with some rock down there. The D7 wasn't happy trying to break through sandstone. From other excavations we'd done, I knew we had a sandstone layer on top of more good clay. I would love to know how the geology of how that happens. No problem, we've got an explosive license. I love that. So we drilled four holes through the sandstone, turned out it was about three feet thick, and after a little dynamite and ANFO, which is ammonium nitrate fuel oil, we were through it. Once we had brakes in it, the D7 would pop it up just fine, so we were back in business. So visualize this pond, cleaning it out, leaks, hit sandstone, blow it up, move it out, find the clay under there. They widened the pond and deepened it to about 19 feet with great clay underneath the sandstone, but I knew we were gonna have a water conduit through that porous sandstone layer because here's what he's saying, that sandstone layer still runs horizontally all the way through on both sides of the pond. So how is he going to seal up that conduit for water? So the sandstone went way back into the banks and then came back in and they packed it with good clay. Even had some bentonite from an earlier project and they mixed it with the clay and they tracked it in all hard. So they compacted it best they could. 
Then they used the overburden to build a 200-yard berm laterally through the forest to divert runoff into the pond. They were off the side of what shows on the topo maps to be Neely Mountain, all 400 feet tall of it. So they're right in the foothills of the Ozark. So basically, what he did was he used some of the dirt and junk that they took out building the pond or cleaning it out and, and, and widening it, making it bigger, to create a levee to divert more water from the from make a bigger watershed basically so they can get more water coming to the pond. They waited on rain. The pond filled on the first heavy rain, but it was obvious they were still leaking. The water quickly dropped down to the sandstone level. They had some great natural springs that just popped up. Of course they did. What to do now? Our clay bentonite packing had obviously not worked. Though he considered a liner and did not want to go that way, didn't even like the idea, but saw in Pond Boss the ad for soil flock pond sealant. Called and talked to them. It was pretty pricey, but a lot less pricey than a liner, and they thought it was worth a try. Applied it as instructed. Didn't have much hope. It slimes you up pretty good as you apply it. But by God, that stuff really works. We did all this about a year and a half ago, and that little pond is held tight as a teacup ever since. We're in the foothills of the Ozark Mountains, and if it will work here, I bet it will solve a lot of Leaky Pond Club members' problems. Looks absolutely gorgeous now. They put a bunch of wood duck houses up on the surrounding trees. Now all I need are the wood ducks. If any of your sponsors package those up as well as soil flock work for us, send them our way. Great magazine. Keep up the good work. <laughs> Well, I love letters like that, and I love a good testimony, and it sounds like Soil Flock worked really, really well for them. So now, let's talk about, let's see, uh, let's see here, I see Ron Ardwan, Willie Al, speaking of leaking, how much evaporation should we expect daily with the 100 degree temperature in Texas? Well, Willie, I know where your pond is, half an inch a day. So when we have these 100 degree days with the uh, humidity down around 30%, you can pretty well bet half an inch of water is going to evaporate every day. Now here's something, if you guys don't know this number, you need to. One acre, one inch deep is 27,000 gallons of water. One acre, one inch deep, 27,000 gallons. So that can kind of give you an idea as to how much water you're actually losing. Now on a, on a typical day, where the humidity, say the, say the temperature is 94, 95, and our humidity is 50 to 60%, it'll be, Oh, three-eighths of an inch a day. But you can pretty well bet in a month you're going to see the water drop a foot to 15 inches. You know, and so if we don't get some rain, you can pretty well bet that your ponds are going to fluctuate. So now, how does all this stuff tie together to where we can bring all the different pieces together to really grow some big, great fish? Well, first of all, it all starts with the water. you got to keep it as long as you can. Now, we've had two examples already of the way water acts. We had water running through the sandstone, and in Willie's case, water going up into the sky to make clouds somewhere. So what's going on, the atmosphere will absorb water. That's where evaporation comes from. And water, here's the deal. Water is always on the move, and we can't do anything about it. So we live with it. So be prepared for that. Be prepared for the fact that you're going to borrow water. That's it. So the better care you can give to your water while you're borrowing it, the better off you're going to be for your fishery. Now let's take the case of the of the fish kill. That six acre lake is aerated with a, with, with a well-designed, well-engineered aeration system. It was stocked in the ways that they wanted to stock it and the fish were thriving. So now they come in, they've had a fish kill due to a cause that they had no control over. So now, how do you bring all these different things together to give you the best chance at growing the best and the biggest fish possible? There's Dave Grunewald, hashtag Pond Boss. Remind that everybody, hashtag Pond Boss Magazine. Click like, share this video to your timeline. You're eligible for a drawing for a Pond Boss hat, Pond Boss mug, you know what? I always do this, but I'm going to do it again. Palm Boss Magazine. Here's the newest issue right there. 35 bucks a year. Cheaper than a Friday night date last a year. <laughs> so if you haven't subscribed yet, I would uh, ask you to. Please do that. You can go to palmboss.com. You can call the office, 800-687-6075, and you can subscribe to the magazine. So now, what are all the things that need to come together to grow a great big fish? Well, water's first. You know, and, and here's some tips about water. 
Water being the universal solvent will dissolve anything it can, which includes rollades, grass clippings, um, limestone, acids. It will absorb minerals, metals. It will even absorb part of a Volkswagen if it's in there long enough. You know, so what happens, these things that are absorbed into water, nutrients, metals, minerals, in turn are utilized by Mother Nature to create something, typically something living, like plants, insects, microbes, which climb on up the food chain and gets to the big fish that you're wanting to grow. There's Chris Horsley. Oh, by the way, you know what? Michael Erig is our winner this week. So Michael, if you're watching, congratulations. You get a hat and a Pun Boss mug. Michael lives in Iowa and he's a real regular watcher. So let's see, Colin King says, what do you think about the light fan insect fish feeders? Do they make a solar powered one? Don't need to answer loud. Um, you know, I can answer that real quick. I don't know that there's a solar powered one, but I've got one on my dock at the house if you want to come look at it, Colin. And I love it because it, it, it's a light. I tell you what, it's really kind of cool. It's a metal stainless steel mixing bowl that this guy fabricated. And there's a um, one of those, uh, hell, I don't remember what you call it, spiral light, the energy efficient one with a whirly gig underneath it, like a little weed eater. So the, the bugs fly around the light, the whirly gig hits it, knocks them in the water. And fish in my pond, bluegill and turtles come up and eat those bugs. But yeah, I think those are pretty cool little gadgets. So now, Number one's water. Now, where I was going a while ago with my comments about water absorbing things, everything that it absorbs affects its chemistry. So it affects the pH, it affects the hardness, it affects the alkalinity, and it affects the water's ability to grow things. So, and when you toss in the, the physical aspects of water where, you know, its density changes as the temperature changes, the water on the surface right now, if you don't have aeration, that water on top is much, much less dense than the water 10 feet deeper. And that's why those layers don't mix so well. You got a warm layer, then a cooler layer, then a cold layer down there below, below the thermocline. So what happens is you, and depending on what's dissolved in your water, you may see some pretty big fluctuations of pH. pH high in the afternoon, low in the, in the morning, high in the afternoon, low in the morning. You might see the same thing with oxygen if you've got a lot of plants. So the plants play a role. The role the plants play is to photosynthesize and produce oxygen during the daytime, but conversely, when there is no daylight, like if it's a cloudy day or after dark, they're respiring, which means they're taking up oxygen to produce carbon dioxide. So that can make spikes in oxygen. You can have high levels of oxygen in the afternoon and lower levels in the morning. The further apart those spikes are, the more stressful it is on your fish. So if you can bring those spikes down with the pH, you do that by buffering the acidity with limestone. That's why it's important to know your water chemistry. With oxygen, it's aeration. If you can bring those two spikes closer together and make your water more stable, then you're gonna have the environment in the medium for your fish to thrive more days out of the year than not. So that's a real important deal. There's Joseph Reynolds checking in. So that's job one. Now, you know, in today's world, you can buy aeration systems, you can buy water circulators, bottom diffused aeration, you can buy windmill driven aerators, you can buy solar powered aerators. So you, basically here's what you've got. You've got bottom diffused aeration, which for circulating water and making it move, that's the best way to go. Circulators are outstanding, especially for shallow water, because you can make water move diagonally and force it to mix and keep that water moving like a river does. So that's a good idea. Uh, Kyle McKean, do you aerate your ponds? I do, I sure do. I aerate two of them, and then with, uh, with a uh, vertex aeration system, and then I've got two more that I aerate with a windmill. But I'm gonna change all that up on the ones with the windmill. At some point, I'm gonna add bottom diffused aeration, but those ponds are pretty shallow because they're hatchery ponds. So then you've got bottom diffused aeration, and then you've also got um, uh, circulators, and then you've also got some kind of aerators. There's different kinds of circulators. Some circulators draft water five or six feet deep and just boil it up at the top. Looks almost like a fountain. And then you've got fountains that draft fairly shallow. Fountains are not as efficient 
when it comes to aeration plus the uh, increased evaporation because the more droplets of water that hit the air, the more they can be absorbed. So if you got a fountain, I'd only turn it on, you know, when you want to enjoy watching it. So now that's the first element's water. So now the next element, this is where it gets a little tricky, and I think a lot of guys don't don't really think about it, is uh, the different habitat. I mean, um, I I can't tell you how many lakes and ponds I look at, and I love it when somebody hunts me down to help them design their habitat in the beginning. You know, up until five or six years ago, I would get way too many calls where there's four feet of water in the dadgum pond and, and people are ready to stock fish, but they want to just, oh, by the way, come and see if my habitat's good. And it's not. You know, everybody that's a bass fisherman, what they think about is putting in the very best habitat to attract big bass. Well, that's a good idea. Do bottom, Kyle asks, do bottom diffusers accelerate evaporation? They do not. Now, I'll tell you what they will do. What bottom diffused aeration systems do is they create a bubble plume that creates vertical movement in water. So it's taking the bottom water, shoving it to the top so it can excuse itself and eliminate itself of any waste byproducts and extra gases and stuff that's been collecting down there. At the same time, it's absorbing oxygen. <clears throat> so what you end up with is an autonomous layer of water from the top down to the diffuser. Now that's a good thing, except this time of year. If you're running an aeration system and your diffusers are sitting on the very bottom, you're going to push your water from the bottom to the top and the temperature is going to be pretty much what the ambient average temperature is for the entire day. And on a day like today in Texas, your average ambient temperature is probably 88 or 89, which means you're going to have water way too hot top to bottom. So the secret, in my opinion, to bottom diffused aeration is don't put your diffusers in the deepest water put them up about four or five feet vertically off the bottom. That way you're gonna leave a thermal refuge for your fish to be able to um, escape the heat. They'd much, much, much rather have cooler water than adequate oxygen, believe it or not. They would, as long as they have enough oxygen, they won't suffocate, they'll get in that water. So even if that cooler water down below your thermocline or down in your thermocline, even if it's only got two and a half, three parts per million total dissolved oxygen, they'd really have that if it's 10 degrees cooler than six inches above, it's 85% saturated with oxygen at six parts per million and it's 88 degrees. So bottom diffused aeration needs to be off the bottom and or set on a timer. I would rather see it set on a timer. That way you're, uh, if it's on a timer running from like nine at night to nine in the morning, you're not exposing that water to the heat as much because you're doing it at nighttime. There's my uh, cousin-in-law, Rebecca Lusk. Hey, girl, Debbie. I see Debbie, my wife, is on here. I have my glasses tonight, honey. There, see, wearing my glasses. And I got on a Pond Boss shirt, too. Pond Boss logo. Pond Boss magazine, 35 bucks a year. Well worth it. <clears throat> so after, after the water, now we talk about habitat. And you, you have got to have habitat for all the different sizes of the different species of fish that you're wanting to grow to get the maximum growth rates and the maximum growth sizes. Now, here's, here's some of the debate that goes on in the fisheries world, and I love to talk about this with other fisheries people. Water, folks, too, too big for a cocktail. Um, A certain amount, oh, here's the dilemma that, that these fisheries guys want to argue about, is increasing habitat does not increase a pond's ability to grow fish. I'm going to call bull on that. Yes, it does. Now, if, if a pond is completely devoid of, of habitat and you add a little bit, it won't impact its ability to produce. But if you add a significant amount of the right kind, and I'm going to tell you what that means here in a minute, then then you got a shot at it. Let's so hope here comes some comments. Here's David Rice. Hey man, never too big for a cocktail. Yeah, well, <laughs> water. Hey, there's Carmen McKay. Hey Carmen, I got your message. Just before I was going to do my show prep, I'll call you after the show and we'll talk a little bit about what you got going on. Carmen has got a pond in, uh, I think, south of Dallas and it's just choked up with aquatic plants. As a matter of fact, Carmen, stick around. 
I'll address that here in a minute because this ties into my topic. So the next key to growing huge fish is growing lots and lots and lots of small fish. Well, in order to grow small fish, you got to have the right food chain. You got to have the right kind of habitat for those small fish. So what Carmen has is she's got a pond that's probably looks like 60 to 70 percent covered, mostly in bushy pond weed. I bet with some cara and looks like some American pond weed. Well, all three of those plants are native to our part of the country, but in her case, she's got way too much. So what you want in your pond for habitat is you want about 20 to 25 percent of the per of the pond per in surface area I'm talking about with some kind of habitat. Now, what habitat means is places for fish to spawn. So if we know it takes 10 pounds of bait fish to grow one pound of game fish, we want enough spawning beds that our bluegills and even the bass can have adequate areas that they can reproduce enough to provide a continual supply of bait fish through the course of the growing season with enough survive to make it into the winter to help those fish really, really pack on some weight in the fall, plus have enough bait fish to come through the winter going into the springtime. So for little bitty fish, that's dense cover. So like what Carmen's got is all this thick mat of aquatic plants that in her case is unsightly and too much. But if you've got a ring of that, say around two thirds of the pond, adjacent to your spawning beds with some brush and water six to eight feet deep, then you've got a community for little bitty fish. Now here's what I mean. When the, when, the baby, when the baby fish come off the beds after they've been hatched, they're going to head straight for that aquatic plant cover. Now, with American pondweed, that's one of my favorites. They've got these leaves, look like willow leaves, floating on the surface with little seed pods sticking out. But the further down under water you go, the less dense it is, and the little bitty fish can navigate it. The big fish can't come in there and raid in there. They can't come in and eat those babies so fast. Well, on the underneath sides of these leaves, if you'll, when you're out there, if you'll pick some of them up and look at them, you're going to see where insects have been chewing on them. You're going to see some film on it. That's biofilm or paraphyton, which is bacteria that's helping cleanse your water, by the way. And it's a good food source for little insects that feed your fish. So, uh, hey, there's Tuesday checking in from the islands. Hey, Tuesday, good to see you. Tuesday Atkinson. Congratulations, honey. You guys got married. That's all that. So, uh, uh, that's the dense cover is real, real important for your bait fish, and I think that's a big, big deal. There's Paige White Cotton. Hey, Paige, good to see you, honey. Debbie's got a bottle of wine for you at the house. Help her remember to give it to you because you're gonna like it. We got it in Oregon several weeks ago when we were there. So, uh, but then you know the aquatic plants and the spawning beds; those are crucial aspects that a lot of guys don't think about. But then adjacent to that, when I said a brush pile, if you'll think, if you'll think brush pile meaning Cedar trees, dense, something dense for fish to be able to get in and hide, but for bigger fish to be able to navigate around, as those bait fish come out, they can eat them. I love rock piles. I'm designing a, a two-acre pond uh, just off the high plains, off the Cap Rock, northeast of Lubbock, Texas, south of Floyd Data. And it's shaped kind of like a boomerang. And actually, I'm writing about it in Pond Boss. So if you're taking the magazine, you're going to get to read it. You're going to see the little maps that I've drawn out and Look at some of the features that they're going to put in there. But what I'm having them do is they've got a lot of rock. So they're going to create rock piles about 20 or 30 feet apart. And between the rock piles, they've got some old dead cottonwood trees that died in a drought. And all's left is the main tree trunk and the big limbs. So they're going to push those over and carry them over with a track hoe and place them at a 45 degree angle with the root ball nearest the shore, but at least five feet underwater then the main trunk of the tree running at a 45 degree angle down in the deepest part of the pond. So if you can figure out how to have all the elements of habitat, not underdo it, but don't overdo it. About 20, 20 to 25% of the bottom of the pond and water less than half deep. So if you've got 18 feet of water, Almost all your structure, cover, habitat needs to be in water nine feet deep or less. So you can be above your thermocline. Now, I'm going to tell you this. If you put a big brush pile down in the biggest, deepest part of the pond and you walk on top of it with a, bull, with a bulldozer like I've seen way too many times, 
complete waste of time, waste of energy. Fish are not going to use that. Oh, now wait, they might use it for a few days in the winter, but they're not going to use it otherwise. So it's wasted. You want it around the perimeter in what's called the littoral zone. That's where all the productivity is going to happen. So if you've got 20 to 25%, now how much is too much? In Carmen's case, from the picture she sent me, it looks like she's got 60 to 70% of her little pond covered with plants. That's way too much. You only need about 10 to 15% with aquatic plants, and the rest of it needs to be in some kind of permanent structure. Now, we'll use bulldozers to create underwater similar creeks, you know, spits, humps, um, islands, peninsulas. More shoreline is better. And in this little two acre pond, we tried to create as much shoreline as we could without breaking the bank on the dirt work because it ended up getting pretty expensive. So uh, uh, if you can figure out, and what I want you to think about is creating the very best habitat with a heavy emphasis on small fish that are gonna in turn feed your bigger fish. And if you'll do those things, now you got the stage set for greater success. So now the, the next part of this uh, ordeal. Hey, Matt Rail, I see you checking in over there from, from Indiana. Good to see you, buddy. The uh, We're just talking about all the little bitty things that come together to grow great big fish. And if you're missing some of these things, your odds of success go down. So if you don't have good stable water, adequate volumes of the right kinds of habitat together, and then bolstered with a food chain, you you are gonna be managing the food chain. That's gonna be your job. So the first decisions you make to have your water right and your habitat right, that's gonna set the stage for your success now as you're managing your fishery. Now the food chain, you know, you, you, gotta, you gotta have goals. If you don't have goals, guess what? You're not gonna hit them. So if your goals are to grow big fish, if your goals are to have a balanced fishery, if your goals are you know, to, to uh, have a trophy fishery, whatever your goals are, you're targeting your management strategy toward that. Danny Tolliver, how long would a cedar tree last submerged for habitat? <clears throat> Danny, a cedar tree will last no more than eight years. And if you're gonna do that to really get the eight years out of it, you need to stand it up. So what we do, if we don't want to bust into the clay line or the pond, I'll have people put them in, you know, cut the lower limbs off, put them in a, in a go to Home Depot, buy a bucket, stick the tree down in it, fill it full of concrete, and then stand them up. Now what'll happen with a cedar tree, and, and when you do that, when you if you do cedar trees, put about eight or 10 of them in a bundle to make one unit. Now those cedar trees, six feet tall, standing in nine feet of water, will be within three feet of the surface. All the needles will be, go, be gone within eight months. The small limbs will be gone within 12 to 18 months. The medium sized limbs will be gone within two and a half years. By about year three, you'll have the biggest limb because I'll tell you this, and Matt Rail will 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 cover my back on this. If if you if the things I'm gonna tell you in a minute, if you don't do that, the first thing that will suffer is your food chain. You know, because what'll happen when you properly stock a pond like Danny Tolliver did here a few years ago over near Bells, you get the forage fish in here, and you and you and you've got of uh, places for them to to live and thrive you got the right kind of habitat you know you got all that stuff going on Your food chain is going to grow stock to bass here we go 18 months two years three years they're even and when that happens it's time to start calling a few bass or your food chain is going to plummet and if you don't here's what's going to happen your food chain is going to go like that then your bass are going to go like this and by the time you figure it out now you're trying to come from behind in a you know in the fourth quarter with a field goal and you can't do that. You want to see that before it happens. <clears throat> That's why some guys like to build hatchery ponds and have hatchery ponds going on so they can supplement their bait fish. You know, and so uh one of the best ways to build a food chain and to keep it is to diversify. You know, bluegill are the backbone of the food chain for bass fishing lakes. Now, I might say that with a little bit of a qualifier. You know, the further north we go, the fewer times that bluegill spawn, the less acceptable they are 